Geopolitical conflicts are happening around the world today, and it's up to all of us to stay informed and seek out the best information possible. Everyone, my name is Cyrus Jansen. I'm an American expat, entrepreneur, and someone who makes weekly vlogs about China and its role in society today. I'd like to welcome you back to my YouTube channel, and I'd like to welcome you to a very special episode, as I recently had the great honor of being a featured guest on the Geopolitics in Conflict show. This show is hosted by Dr. David and Dr. Ross, two doctors based in Dallas, Texas, who make weekly videos about very complex issues, ranging from global trade to economics, geopolitics, and energy. In total, our conversation lasted for well over an hour, and the video that you're about to watch is simply a recap of our entire conversation broken down into a convenient 20 minutes. At the end of this video, I will be providing links to the Geopolitical Conflict Show where you can watch the entire one hour episode. But without further ado, let's jump into the studio and bring you the highlights. Today we have a very, very special guest and uh, I'd like to introduce Cyrus. Wow, Ross, your Chinese is fantastic. <laughs> so what we're going to be discussing today, uh, basically in general format, just a conversation uh, uh, while we have you here, is we're going to be talking about the uh, concept or the, inform the, uh, the topic of misinformation. And what I mean by this is the idea of why all of a sudden Western media, including here in the U.S., that all of a sudden they are targeting China with this misinformation. So you know, recently you did, you did a show where you, you showed, here's a, here's a neutral headline about, say, maybe Germany. Yeah. And, said, and here's similar content, but look how it's slanted in a negative way about China. Correct. Can you talk a little bit about that? There's, there's a, a viewpoint from many Westerners about China that unfortunately is stuck in the past, you know, and it could be yeah. 30, 40 years old. You know, we still, amazingly, even though we know that China is this rising power that, you know, they have all of this infrastructure, you know, sometimes the stereotype that exists is still, you know, China from the 1970s. Everybody's, you know, driving bicycles. Everybody's poor. Uh, a lot of these start to exist. And, you know, again, I just started seeing more and more negative coverage of China. And I, and I believe it really is, you know, because of China's rise and what they've accomplished over the last 30 years. You know, there's certainly, uh, you know, it, it is not a question of if China will become the number one superpower. It is always when China will do this. Exactly. It will overtake the United States. That is that is a fact. That is something that the world will have to deal with. Um, and so I believe that's when you started seeing a shift and everything started to become a lot more negative on the media side. That is what, if, what is at the core uh, argument for the West and the United States, why they couldn't accept the rise of China. Correct. And what, the way to counter that is by providing this misinformation. Oh, absolutely. You know, there's, there's a really interesting phrase that, we, that I've heard, and it said there's basically two types of foreigners. Uh, there's one foreigner hates China, the other foreigner has been to China. <laughs> that was a good one, Cyrus. <laughs> and, and, and I think I think it's really interesting because I mean, and kind of the interesting phenomena is is and and I'll tell you, I'm going to tell you a quick story that, that that was the absolute tipping point to me starting a YouTube channel. I, I had I was on LinkedIn and I was I, I had wrote an article and somebody had commented to me and he said. You know, your views on China are so terrible. You know, China is a horrible country. The government is doing horrible things. And I, I looked at his profile and he was the managing editor of this blog. That was his primary source of income. That was his job for the mm. last eight years. And I went to his blog and everything, every single article was a very negative article about China. Yeah. And I, and I thought, wow, this is, I was like, okay, this is really interesting. So, so I read about three of the different articles, you know, very nice writer, you know, very, you know, I said, okay, okay, you're putting, you know, you're putting together a lot of interesting points. I don't necessarily agree with them all, but you know, you're obviously experienced in what you do. So I messaged him. I said, I'm really interested to know your story. You know, how long did you spend in China? Um, you know, what, what experiences did you have in China that really changed your viewpoint? And you know what he said? I've never been there. I've never been there and I don't <laughs> need to. <laughs> and I said, I'm all right, time out. You have an, your entire job is to write about China. You have a blog that writes weekly stuff about China, and yet you've never spent a single day inside the country. And he said, well, I know exactly what my grandfathers were fighting, you know, in Nazi Germany. 
you know, I didn't need to go to Nazi Germany to realize it's bad. And I said, well, that's a very poor comparison because, you know, the two couldn't be more different. And it's just amazing to me. And I just said, wow, this is this is really terrible because you have a guy that has a platform who is spreading disinformation. Look, I got to I got to get out there and get my message out, because, you know, with this guy putting out this dis- disinformation, this is just spreading hate. And, and and then we saw COVID come and everything escalated. And so. Yeah. Anyways, it's just really important to stay informed and get some real insights into the ground and what's happening in China. Before we started this, our show, I was following three very negative websites about China. Mm -hmm. And you probably know what they all are, but yeah, because I'm not going to mention them. Mm -hmm. And then when we started really digging deep into this, I realized that's that's worse than useless. That's adding to an unnecessary conflict. When the world needs for these, the two major powers to come together, not continue to be in conflict. Absolutely. More, we, and you say it over and over again, we have more in common than, we, that, than separates us. You know, we're more similar than we are different. You know, Chinese people are no different than Americans. You know, we all want, you know, you know, the best for our children. We all want to get a better job. We all want to have a better life. You know, all of us are trying our best in this world to put one foot in front of the other, you know, achieve some success and have it enjoy time with our family. I mean, that's pretty much everybody in the world's trying to do that. And right. so I think when you get down to the politics and stuff, um, you know, I had somebody say, I heard an American say, you know, I think we should invade China uh, militarily just so we can liberate the people of China. <laughs> and I said, and, and I said, you know, you don't understand China because I guarantee if you go to China and you talk to the majority of the people there, you know, the majority, the vast majority would say, you know, we're happy with our life here in China. The last thing we want is the United States to, to come into our country and to tell us what to do. Uh, you, 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 let's be honest. We don't really have a good track record of doing that. And <laughs> and, you know, I think that that's, again, um, again, I, and, I, and if an American says that to me, I say, you know, what we should do. Let's focus on our problems in America. We have a lot of them, and oh, there's yeah. a lot. There's a lot of things that we can improve on inside of America. Let's focus on that. You know what happened if Joe Biden would have came out and said, you know what, I don't necessarily agree with Donald Trump's viewpoint towards China. You know, why don't we learn to work together with China, and why don't we try to start a new relationship? That probably would have cost him the election yeah, because, yeah. unfortunately, the only thing that both Republicans and Democrats can agree on, the only bipartisan thing we can agree on is being anti-China. It's the one thing that ironically is <laughs> uniting America. And I think it's really difficult because if anybody like yourselves or myself, I've been attacked on YouTube as well. When anybody says, you know, we need a better relationship with China, we need to work this out. You must be paid by the CCP. Who benefits from this misinformation? Let's be honest. War is profitable. Unfortunately, you know, you know, the United States is a war based economy. We have international conflicts all over the world. We have tremendous dealings with weapon manufacturers. You know, all of our politicians have ties to lobbyists who are campaigning for all of these things. Uh, I mean, it's a very uh, difficult system. And it's one in which you can really ask yourself, you know, how does an elected public official have the best interest of his people at heart? You know, when all of these lobbyists and all of these uh, things are happening on, on the background. So know? misinformation is limited not only to this human rights and this and that or cultural aspect, but also in geopolitic, uh, political aspect. Look just how the, uh, because they know an average Joe or average Jane is not going to be understanding that kind of language. They worry about what's for dinner. Yes. They're not going to be worried, you know, and, and, and the government find it convenience to them to do that kind of uh, 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 misinformation. You know, I'm afraid that I bore all my friends with uh, what we're going, what's going on with the show. Yeah, it sort of spills out, and I can't help but talk about China and all the rest of this. For sure. And my friends are relatively well educated, mm-hmm. and I bring up the China, and and most recently, my one of my close friends said, "We need to be afraid of them." I said, "How?" They said, well, "They steal all of our jobs." I go. Yeah. On. Cut me a break. Yeah, they don't know. They don't know. They the just automation is the thing. Yeah. And the, the way the contracts were set up to, we'll manufacture, we in China will manufacture, just tell us how to do it. Yeah. So they they live up to their, their part of the bargain. And now the result is they steal our jobs. Yeah. 
when, well, it, when it's mo much more complicated than that. China's stealing our jobs. Just remind me one more time. Was it China that begged the, the U.S. companies to come over and, you know, no. I, I, are, is China forcing Apple to come over and like, you must manufacture your iPhones here? No, it's Apple going over and saying, I want to make, you know, I want to manufacture there. We are not uh, comfortable with the speed by which China ray, uh, uh, has ra uh, risen. So yeah. it, it's just that's 30 years, 40 years, and all of a sudden you are at the, the top of the pack. Correct. And, and we're having a hard time accepting that reality. It doesn't seem that the United States is willing to sit down, or the West for that matter, sit down and have, a, you know, direct talks with... Because we come in with that attitude of we are superior, we are this, we are that. Those days are gone. Yeah. <laughs> that era is gone. And we better just grip with the reality that China is rising power, whether we like it or not. And the geopolitical shift is happening, whether we like it or not. And it's yeah. going to be a new world that where the United States is not the dominant power anymore, like like empires before it, the Brits, the Portuguese, the Spaniards, the Dutch, you name it. Yeah. That's just how things go. A change happening, and we need to change with it. One of the things we, that we hear here in the United States is the Chinese people are so repressed. They can't voice their opinion. Yeah. Uh, and by the way, if they, if they open their mouths, their, heart, their organs are going to be harvested. The top social media content creator in all of China in 2020, he was a professor from a university. Uh, he has tens of millions of followers in China. And what he does is he, he looks at different law cases inside of China. And he basically talks about them on his channel and he and as a result of this you know he calls for public outcry to change this specific law and this was something that we saw earlier in china this year in march 1st 2021 there was 13 new laws that were passed in china and every single one of them came as a result of public outcry people saying i do not like this law it is not fair we need to change it what about social media it's censored in china it is censored in china but guess what there's a lot of censorship that goes on oh, it's here. Yeah. <laughs> in, in America. Oh, yeah. well. Anything about that here? We always hear debt trap economy. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just everywhere. But no one talks about that there's already been eight trillion dollars worth of trade done in BRI. So that means that's real tangible results that are affecting the lives of you know people around the globe. And I think that's really important to highlight. The United States, we have provided a tremendous amount of humanitarian aid around the world. And I think that's a fantastic thing. The interesting thing is, is that it's about, it's, it's, it's the analogy of giving a man a fish or teaching him how to fish. Yes. Because yeah. you, you come into Africa and you fix, I'm going to fix your lip. Okay, great. But at the end of the day, you're living in a poor village. You have no roads. You have no education. You know, how are you going to get out of that? And you're looking at a country that has no, you know, very much lacking the infrastructure. And we're saying, okay, we're going to build you a road. We're going to build you a, a port. And we're going to start building infrastructure there. And now all of a sudden, you guys can start manufacturing. Now all of a sudden, you can start exporting things. Now all of a sudden, you have a pathway to become an entrepreneur or at least probably double your salary. I don't see China going around the world spreading their way of life. At the end of the day, Chinese people and the government is interested in relationships and interested in doing business. business. And I think if that's what we can really focus on, um, you know, there's no problem. The biggest problems between our two countries, America and China, comes down to a cultural differences. You look back at that Alaska meeting that took place at the beginning of oh, this year. Yeah. Oh, fiasco. Yeah. Oh, right? I mean, at the end of the day, it is just it, it goes back to that thing. Well, we are America. You need to do it our way. And China just says, look, at the end of the day, you know who should be included in that G7 meeting? China can't just be America and its Five Eyes Alliance first, you know, that control the world. Yeah, right. China, China deserves a seat at the table. Every place that China goes that, that, that they're loaning, making loans and doing these, the Belt and Road Initiative, they're saying we want a win-win scenario here. We see the United States budget as almost $800 billion. We see the, the uh, 
Chinese economy, which is focusing a whole lot more on education Correct. than on the military. And what's the comparison here? I mean, what do you yeah. think this? Well, I think with military, um, one of the things that I think we got to be very honest. Uh, the United States has the biggest military in the world. Uh, there's, there really isn't a country that could compete with us. I mean, if we're talking with a battle to battle, if we're going to, let's, I mean, number two military in the world is China. If China and the United States went to a conflict, the United States would easily win that. I mean, we would, I mean, we have the, the, the technology, the infrastructure to, you know, really dominate militarily. However, you know, I think that China, I mean, if you are in China's position, you are going to be building up a military. I mean, you have a country of 1.4 billion people. Um, the, I mean, it's the same reason. Why does America with 330 million people, why do we have so much money invested in the military? You know, why do we have 800 military bases around the world that we are maintaining? You know, are we really worried about national security? Are we worried about you know, who's <laughs> going to attack us? I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, we spend more on military than the next nine countries combined. Yeah. Uh, you know, most of whom are our, our, our closest allies. Wow. So, <laughs> you know, so it's, it's just an interesting thing. I mean, we know that the United States will always have a very big military. I mean, I, as an American, I don't fear uh, a, a growing Chinese military because I know that China's not going to attack America. They just have no interest in doing that. But I do believe that they are growing a military presence, you know, because if I was in China's position, I would be doing that as well. When I went to China in 07, it, it was a very different China back then. It was a little bit more like the wild, wild west, for lack of a better analogy. I yeah. mean, things were things were not as structured and disciplined. And I and I like to tell the story of when I got my driver's license for the first time in China. In 2007, you could walk into the driver's license bureau in Shanghai and you could literally pay somebody a hundred renminbi on the spot to sit down and take the test for you. Well, now, now everything's by the book, right? You have these certain policies and standards. And I think this is what you've seen in China is there's a progression. You know, there is a progression. It's becoming more and more westernized. It's becoming more and more structured. You know, I mean, last time I was in China, um, you know, you're in a restaurant and everything's no smoking and you have people going outside to smoke. And, and, and I mean, that is so con such a foreign concept because when I first went, you know, everybody's smoking inside a restaurant. And I even thought to myself, I'm like, wow, this is unusual because, you know, in America, you know, we, we've banned smoking for a long time. Oh, and yeah. I said, and I remember thinking to myself, you know, this is something that probably not, will never change because smoking is very big in Chinese society. And I mean, can you imagine Beijing trying to pass a law to ban smoking? That'll never happen. Oh, wow. And here you go. Now it's banned everywhere. You can't smoke inside these restaurants. People observe the rules. You know, it's 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 changing, you know, and, and getting more and more uh, better. And I think that's really, really important for people to right. understand. You know, I've been following what's going on with Taiwan. Mm -hmm. And there wasn't much there wasn't the, the former the former president of Taiwan. He said, let's just get along with the mainland. Yeah. OK. And the mainland just left pretty much let them alone from what I could tell. Right. And then a new president came on and she said, we want our independence. And it's just threw gasoline on a small flame and made it a big flame. Correct. And so my observation is, if you just let it alone, the, the central government's not going to mess with you. Is that a good observation? You have a youth that is consuming social media, that is really influenced very heavily from America. And you have... Um, a new president, a new female president there in Taiwan, you know, she has really ridden on the coattails of this social media influence and really, you know, saying the things that the youth want to hear and garnering a tremendous amount of support from the youth in Taiwan. But older Taiwanese, they don't like her. They don't like her and they don't like her radical way of thinking because they're on the standpoint of, you know, we need, we need to have a relationship with, you know, mainland China. At the end of the day, Mainland China wants, you know, improved relations and more uh, economic cooperation with Taiwan as well. China can figure out what is the best system for them to govern. Um, and again, look at their track record the last 30 years. They've achieved a tremendous amount of success. The moment China starts trying to export that around the world, most specifically in my country, America, if they come and try to say, America, you should be communist, I'll be the first one to say, no, China, you're wrong. Please retreat. Do not try to come in. 
But I think we should offer the same respect back. Why should we yes. go into China and say, you need to do it our way? That is not showing the respect. And again, this is how I conclude everything. This is why issues go back to a cultural difference between our countries. The, the, talking with you has been just absolutely wonderful and fascinating. Everybody, I want to thank you for making it to this point in the video. If this is your first video that you've watched of mine, I invite you to hit that subscribe button. And if you like today's video, please go ahead and go over to the Geopolitics in Conflict YouTube channel, give them a subscribe, and also watch the entire hour-long conversation. We go into all of these topics in much more detail. And finally, if you're interested in joining our team, I'd like you to click down in the links below and jump join us on Patreon. It's a great way that you can support the channel and also receive some exclusive content from me. Thank you everybody for your time and I look forward to seeing you all in a future video.